Ithom Venture Partners. Really appreciate your time today for the panel hosted by Ithom Venture Partners and Lick Security on innovations disrupting the automotive connectivity and security. Ithom is a deep tech accelerator and, uh, and, and a firm based in Singapore with approximately 90 startups in our portfolio. Lux is one of the startups that we recently onboarded in January 2023 cohort. Today, we are hosting this panel with some industry leaders from the automotive security and connectivity sector so that we can learn from their insights. We can build a fabulous community of subject matter experts. Today, we have Tom and Alon from Lux Security, who are the founders of Lux Security. And we have a fabulous panel formed by Shivalik Prasad from Sebros, David Lampert from Foresight Automotive, and Dr. Ramya from Herman Baker Automotive Systems. Now, without further ado, I would request Alon to do a brief intro of Lick Security, and then would love to get into the introduction of panelists. And then obviously, there'll be a bunch of interesting questions and exciting questions that Alon is going to ask to our panelist. Alon, please take it from there. Excellent. Thank you, Pankaj. I'm happy to be here. Hey, guys. Nice to see all these friendly faces. Uh, my name is Alon Shalev. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Look Security. And my partner, Tom, is here with us. We're basically building a fully automated security testing suit to cover all the activities needed in order to meet the, the new regulation and in general, to help any other OT, IoT, or embedded device manufacturer to meet security standards in a click. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Alon. Uh, now I would request David to introduce himself and Foresight. Hi, thank you for your time today and to invite me uh, for this uh, panel. Uh, I'm the VP R&D of Foresight Automotive. Uh, what is Foresight doing? They're giving a solution for the autonomous car of stereo cameras, two visible camera and thermal cameras, and we're giving a perception, point cloud, depth map. Uh, we're working on some fields, military, automotive, logistic, um, agriculture, that's all. Thanks, thanks a lot, David, appreciate it. Dr. Ramya? Yeah, hi, I'm already unmuted. Hi, so I work for as a security and software architect in the Herman Becker Automotive Systems. Um, I have around, uh, my main area is in the connectivity domain. So, and also I'm getting into the embedded security aspects or I'm concentrating more on the embedded security aspects because I work for the connectivity um, ECUs. And I have around 18 plus years in the automotive field. So mainly, uh, previously with diagnostics and now with embedded security and connectivity. That's about me. Thanks a lot, Dr. Ramya. Uh, Shivalik? Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Shivalik. I am the VP at a company called Cibros. Um, I'm part of the business team. And um, Cibros is a, is a company head office in San Jose in California. And uh, we are one of the largest or the fastest growing company in the deep connected software platform. That essentially means we have the ability to collect uh, high frequency data from any kind of automobile, whether it's a car, bus, truck, autonomous vehicle. Um, and uh, we are able to do full vehicle software updates automatically across the globe. And um, I lead that part of the business for Asia Pacific and some customers in Europe. Fantastic, yeah. Shivalik. Really appreciate your time. Okay, uh, Tom, uh, alone now it's your time to take out those interesting questions from your uh, from your list and, and start asking the panelists. Excellent. Oh, hello, guys. Um, being a founder in the automotive industry and looking around uh, what's going on around all the tier ones and OEMs, I have a few questions that, again, I never really got true answers by asking people that were trying to sell them our solution or trying to convince them to invest in our solution but it'll be nice to hear your point of view on the following questions. And my first question is basically, what is the most painful challenge that uh, automotive innovation leaders are concerned about today? And of course, in the next few years. Probably Shivali can start. Yeah, so, um, so I have had the opportunity to speak with about 140 OEMs at, at C-level executive in the last three, four years. And uh, 
basically as the vehicles are getting more software defined, it is becoming very hard for the OEM or the automotive, automotive manufacturer to be able to handle that. Uh, typically, they would go to a big tier one, uh, maybe in Germany or in Japan or in US, and they would say, okay, you are looking into the engine space, you're looking into the body control or the chassis space, you're looking into the safety space, and you know, please look into it and, and, and take care of the, your ECUs. Um, as the vehicles are getting more and more software defined and more software is coming into the ECUs, the number of ECUs are reducing, uh, the vehicles are becoming more Ethernet backbone based. Um, it is becoming harder and harder for the OEM to kind of understand that. Uh, so all the mega OEMs in the world are investing billions of dollars to kind of uh, put together large software teams um, in India, in Israel, in Seattle, in Shanghai, in, in Tokyo, um, and, and trying to kind of quickly catch up to the software world, right? Because they're more mechanical focused and they're more um, electrical focus, not electronics and software focus. So that's that's a big deal. That's a big problem for them. Uh, they don't come. Most of them don't come from a software background, but uh, I believe that they will adapt in the next uh, you know five seven years. Uh, you know, they are smart guys, but that's that's something that's challenging for them right now. You know, software defined vehicles. I think also from the software uh, point of view, we also see a lot of uh, problematic of regulation. Because all the regulation, the ISO, and all that, it's very uh, painful point for uh, all the companies. We are a software company and a hardware company, and, and I see that the regulation very hard. And also, when we work with some companies that work with Expedia or Tube, know that this is the company that certified uh, the ISO. Uh, they also doesn't know how to work with the, all the AI and how they can say that each function will not kill anyone in the world uh, from the software view. And this is one of the also the challenges that I'm seeing when uh, Shiva talk about software. Dr. Ramya? Yeah, so I would like to have uh, two dimensions to it. So one is basically when we talk about painful challenges, I would say the painful challenges the automotive industry faces are also with respect to the supply chain, with respect to the supply chain and also with respect to the talent. But that's the other part, which is not part of these discussions. But the technical challenges are, as Shivalik uh, mentioned, and as also David. So basically, one is a regulation and the other is a software. So more and more. Uh, the automotive industry is moving towards uh, software, which means uh, the vehicle architecture itself is changing. So because more comfort, so less number of uh, microcontrollers and microprocessors in the vehicle. So Volkswagen has uh, come up with uh, a new architecture, uh, something like a system scalable platform, which has reduced microprocessors and microcontrollers. And with respect to the vehicle architecture, the, the electronics architecture also, which means what Shivalik was mentioning. So basically, the software is concentrated uh, not on the domains or functions. So previously, there used to be a, uh, for each uh, function of the vehicle, there used to be a one domain ECU or a domain controller. So for example, uh, the vehicle ignition system had one or something like a diagnosis system had uh, the diagnostics, uh, each ECU had the diagnostics, of course, but each of the vehicle functions, the body functions had the body functions ECU. Now it's like more of a zonal architecture, which is the most uh, prevalent architecture in the electrical vehicles and more towards a software defined car. So that's the challenge now uh, that we are having in the automotive. I want also to add about a little bit about the cyber challenge that I'm seeing uh, for the software uh, point of view. Um, I, I think also for like a, other companies of software, uh, they need to secure the system and protect the library that we work on it because cyber attacks, because other want to your uh, code. And here is something that maybe I don't have more answers from uh, my point of view. Uh, that we always have a question about it. How you will work if you have a cyber attack? How if someone wants to see what your inputs in the code and outputs? 
and uh, it's not uh, more easier from the regulation that uh, Shvilek, uh, Shvilek talk about that or the uh, architecture that uh, Raja Kumar uh, told about that. Uh, maybe here you have any point of view for us or a solution about all the cyber uh, threats that we have. Yes, uh, well, it's funny to hear that all you guys that come from the automotive industry are speaking mostly that the biggest pain point is software and it kind of goes along with um, what the last uh, CEO of uh, Volkswagen said recently, that they're doing a shift from becoming an automotive company to becoming a software-based company. Uh, similar as uh, Tesla, they're not the first one that are saying that Tesla Eventually, the a software company that on the way is creating cars. So it's, it's very interesting that, that your answers. Uh, regarding about the ways how to uh, pinpoint or solve these problems, it's basically with um, training and tools uh, because a developer will never be a security expert and a security expert will never be a developer in our point of view. Um, but I'll love to jump into the next question. Um, what are the what are the innovations or solutions, uh, kind of new solutions in your space that you're excited about? Stuff that you see in your areas. I can I can go first. So, so what we what we are looking at, we're not looking at automobiles only from a passenger vehicle perspective. It could be a motorcycle, it could be a scooter, it could be an e-bike, it could be a electric based, you know, uh, flight, uh, you know, some kind of a air mobility vehicle, right? And and we're seeing a lot, a lot of these all over the world coming up in, in, in different ways, shapes and forms with a lot of money backing it. Um, so there's a fundamental shift that has happened in the last 10 years. And I guess Tesla has kind of uh, given that head start or, or, or mobile phones where let's say 20 years ago i bought a car and it was a mechanical car it has an ic engine and i used it i went got a few oil changes done i got the brake pads changed and that was pretty much it right and i had an fm station i had a navigation system maybe and then that was it um now with software enabled vehicle or software defined vehicle whatever name you want to call it um the vehicle is always fresh so as long as the hardware can support it you will keep updating the vehicle. So let's say I am in India and India has many, many uh, regional languages, right? And, and, and many national languages. And depending on which part of the country you're in, you can change your, your, your HMI screen of your, of your cluster based on what, you, what language you want to see it. Right now it's all English predominantly, right? Or you want to say, um, I want to homolocate a vehicle. Right now it takes about three years for a new vehicle to come up from drawing board to, to launch or three and a half years. Uh, but if I want to, let's say I'm an I'm a OEM in Japan and I want to launch in South America, uh, I want to be able to homolocate my braking systems, my wiper systems and, and, and things of that, right? For example, if you're in Israel or, you know, it doesn't rain that much compared to, let's say, in, uh, in Australia or in South America, um, why are my wiper settings predominantly the same, right? Or even in different parts of Thailand or Indonesia or something, right? So, so you want software to be... Um, modified or updated or changed or manipulated uh, based on your hyper personalization requirements just like mobile phones so i think that's where we are looking as, as a pretty excited space so every vehicle gets personalized for you so if my if i'm driving the car and i want to drive slower and my wife likes a peppy drive and it's an electric vehicle the moment she walks up to the car her phone gets paired over bluetooth the car senses her and changes all the settings right it, it gives you a reduced range a higher torque uh, changes the seat position, uh, changes the radio stations on the cockpit, all of that automatically happens within like, you know, 10 seconds or 15 seconds. And it's not very hard to do. Uh, and, and that's kind of where we are going, at least with um, four wheelers. And similar things will happen with, let's say, agriculture equipment, construction equipment, uh, two wheelers, where if you are, um, you are, you know, we are working with a company, which is a tractor company, and a uh, tractor has only two ECUs. It has an uh, engine ECU and it has uh, a cluster and maybe telematics. And based on where the tractor is, they want to change the engine mapping. So if it's, you know, if it's working at 18,000 feet altitude in, in the Himalayan region, it wants to have a different engine mapping. If it's, you know, doing bricklaying or is doing farming, it wants to have a different engine mapping. 
Um, and then and you should be able to flip that on on the fly by just pressing a mobile you know command or or something on 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 your mobile phone. So using software, you can keep your vehicle fresh, which reduces your depreciation of your value of your vehicle, uh, keeps your insurance premiums up, so the insurance company benefits. Uh, your banking finance, uh, you know, becomes higher because now your value of your vehicle doesn't depreciate at that rate, and and the customer finds it more exciting. You know, if 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 there was um, an Android Auto and Apple CarPlay on a vehicle which got launched today, but if you have a four-year-old vehicle, you don't have it, right? But if it's software enabled, you say, okay, I'm going to pay another hundred dollars and I'm going to get this uh, this new feature on my um, on my car. Uh, so those kind of things are pretty interesting, at least from from the world I'm looking at. And and that's something which will become more and more popular as time goes on, you know. And of course, cybersecurity does come into all of that because you're touching pretty much everything of the car. You know, it's interesting for me to think how maybe with software we can uh, uh, reduce the resources of the battery of the electrical uh, vehicle. Uh, I think most of the challenge that we seeing today how companies can take the battery of the car and uh, will need less of charging. And uh, most of the thing that they talk with us, okay, you, now you use with the CPU on 30%, 20%, let's reduce that. Be, to save more, um, to save more battery for uh, for the long distance. And also the, you know, I think the interesting in the, our industry of the uh, autonomous driving, it's all the potential, uh, how we can re reduce a uh, accident. We can improve the traffic flow to recognize the object detection from a long distance and uh, bring data to the ECU and uh, then then give a solution for uh, for the all the sensor. Uh, how how we can. Uh, how we can uh, stop the car. Uh, about the connected cars also, like Shvilik told me, I, I'm very interested about the V2X, how without sensors, our phones, our car can talk each other and understand if we have accident or uh, to see pedestrian when no one from the sensors uh, of the car can see that. Dr. Lamia? Yeah, so for me, I think uh, there are two aspects. Uh, one is, uh, I mean, I think uh, I think uh, um, Shivalik and then David covered, uh, one was the ADAS functions, which David covered, and uh, Shivalik covers uh, personal experience within the car. The other one is the connectivity, actually, the other dimension. Because now, if you see, I mean, in maybe um, I'm also uh, very excited about this, so we have different devices talking with the car. So it's not only the car, it's not only within the car where you have the personalization within the car, but you have different devices talking because you have this cellular V2X communications for better, uh, for better, it can be for, um, so that you can see uh, easily recognize blind spots uh, you can easily, um, I mean, you have an addition in the, um, I mean, uh, uh, the parking assistance sensors and which say whether there is an obstacle in the road or if you have something like you want to change a different route, then maybe you get those from maybe some other sensors installed on the road. So you have the complete infrastructure, which is basically talking with the vehicle. It's just not the vehicle alone. So that's what is making this uh, full uh, landscape exciting because I don't talk with only the other car or I don't only talk. So I talk with the other cars. I talk with the infrastructure. I talk with the sensors on the road. So it's like a complete web of IoT devices which I talk with. And that makes the situation more complex because I have a multitude of wireless devices installed on my ECU. I have many wireless. I have the I have maybe the satellite communication, I have the Wi-Fi, I have the Bluetooth, Bluetooth maybe for personalization, I have the millimeter wave and whatnot. So basically, and I also have the uh, this uh, remote keyless entry. So it's like more uh, equipped with connectivity and more with the outside world and the car is talking to everything and that's what is exciting for me in this uh, in this area, yeah. 
Oh, very interesting. You're all saying the same thing, just in a different points of view. Again, in your specific pain points where you're dealing today. But uh, I'll, I'll like to jump to the next question, and I think it will kind of continue what Raima just said now. But how do you see this space evolving in the next five to ten years, Raima? Dr. Ramya, please start. Yeah, okay, I can start. So as I was telling, this space is evolving because more and more, for example, from a car, I can say to today, I have stopped, I have to stop the heating in my home. It's possible in another maybe one or two years because I talk with some other uh, sensor on the road and this communicates and I have basically one more sensor installed in my house and then basically it, it talks to the sensor and say, okay, let me have, have the heating on. Now we have the telematics in the car where we do by remote services, mobile. We basically do the preheating of the seats. We do the door unlock, lock and all. This is just one small step, but we can still extend it because this is a web of uh, connectivity, which, which I'm, I'm foreseeing. Also in the vehicle to vehicle communication, which is also there in uh, other, it's not only in automotive, uh, you also have in other uh, heavy vehicles and other things where you can have uh, many. So basically, uh, I mean, the fleet operations, uh, so better fleet operations, or you want to line up a list of trailers. And so many operations are possible with the, with this, uh, I think, IoT devices. And I think this will grow. The amount of devices which communicate, the amount of data which the car gets, uh, the amount of inflow of data which the car gets and the amount it has to give the flow of data this will go exponentially in the next five to ten years and that's what i am predicting so yeah not even five to ten years five years yeah ten years i do not know what what else the car will do basically even yeah so so david so uh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry i can give the next one so my 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 take is Connectivity is a given, right? I mean, I and I, I I break the world into three three parts, right? The first world country, the second world country, and the third world country, right? And you have to see it all. And and so if you look at a company like Toyota, that that transpasses across the board, or Honda motorcycle that goes across the board, right? So if you're looking at from a connectivity point of view, a lot of the global fleets, like Ford Motor Company, let's say, is almost ninety nine point five percent connected. Almost all the vehicles have some kind of a SIM card. Uh, now with direct uh, low orbit satellites coming into place, uh, you have um, you know satellite connectivity coming up. Uh, in 2025 onwards to 2026, uh, most of the cars will at least have two or three modems, depending on the kind of vehicle it is, including B2X or B2I or whatever it is, right? So connectivity is given. A data exchange with a server or a central computer is given. Uh, so from from what excites me is, is it's. So we're going back to the mainframe world, right? So the mainframe became, you know, client and, and server world and the cloud is again back to mainframe, right? And and these cars are basically edge node compute systems, which are doing things um, from, a, from a user point of view, uh, where you can, you know, heat up the car, open the door and, and all those kind of things. But uh, more than anything else, um, uh, the requirement for mobility never goes away. You know, people keep moving, it doesn't matter who you are and where you are, and we still want to meet our friends and family and everything. So any anything that delights a customer uh, is something that works well. So I would, there was a survey in, in UK that despite all this technology, the most important thing is, is music, right? Almost 80% of all car owners want good music in their car, right? Above and beyond an autonomous vehicle and everything else, right? So that being said, uh, as long as connectivity is ubiquitous, uh, a lot of personalization will come in. Uh, for different different use cases because a lot of the world is aging. That's another thing to look at, right? It means an average age in the next 20, 25 years may land up being at 50 or 55 years of age. A lot of the world, at least the Western world, is aging rapidly. And uh, if most of these people who are 65 plus or 70 plus cannot drive a car, uh, they need a different set of environment to be able to move from place A to place B, right? And 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 some of the OEMs are working on it. But just, you know, simple electrification or going to hydrogen cells, or you know, IC engines or solar powered vehicles. Uh, a lot of these things are great, but as an end consumer, how does it make my life better? So I think connectivity is something which is very important. And then using this connectivity and using a software layer to personalize 
Um, I think that's something that is pretty exciting. And then a lot of things to enable that infrastructure, like cybersecurity, like cloud compute, like edge compute, uh, machine learning algorithms to be able to, you know, find use cases or, you know, data patterns. Uh, how does a 75-year-old person in North America behave as opposed to a 95-year-old person in Japan? Right? Uh, those kind of questions will kind of pop up, which don't exist today. So a lot of those uh, interesting things will 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 happen, and uh, and and yeah, we are in a hyper-connected world. You know, we could not do the Zoom call, you know, ten years ago. It was impossible. Now it's you're anywhere, and 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 that can happen. So th these things, so connectivity becomes a backbone, an infrastructure backbone, which will spawn up a lot of interesting use cases, which we don't exist. But I, but data compute um, uh, to find inference and, and 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 meaning, and to be able to do it in a safe, secure manner. These two things will not go away, or whatever name you want to call it, right? The names will keep changing. So, so connectivity excites us. I think that's on the next five years, ten years itself. So, for me, it's like uh, Ramya, it's how to tell about ten years. But in the five years, from the other's point of view, uh, most of the cars will be level three and level four. Uh, maybe we will success in ten years to do this panel when I'm driving driving in the car. But on the near five years, it's uh, level three and level four. We still need to be awake, um, and the potent, the the from the connected cars, I want to see and believe uh, that we will see more connectivity of sensors, cameras, software embedded in vehicles, um, and also the connectivity of the cables. Today you have uh, one kilometer of cable in the car and uh, talking about some of the companies that it will be only some hundred of meters that it will be reduce the weight of the car and uh, more powerful car and uh, uh, like that the software can work with other ways and uh, really it uh, will be interesting to do the same thing in uh, five years from today to see what what is changed so basically what I understand from your perspective, the next five years is going to be a nightmare for the IT technicians that we need to actually connect the car to our house, to all the sensors. And the other side will be a paradise for cybersecurity experts that are bored at home that would like to gain access to all these areas. But the future looks uh, funny. So My if next, you, if you, yeah. So before you go there, so if you look at um, Apple, right? And Apple was the first company which has seamless integration, right? Your mobile phone, your laptop, your Apple TV, everything synchronizes with each other, right? And then Netflix did it and, and some of these brands did it, right? Uh, car becomes an extension of the house, essentially. So, uh, and if you have two or three cars, then uh, as long as they're connected, uh, they all synchronize with each other, right? And if it's snowing a lot or if it's very hot, automatically the car will turn on and, and cool itself or heat itself. Uh, depending on if you have a small child going with you. I mean, a lot of those things which you don't even, which which we'll take for granted. Like, you know, Netflix is a good example, right? We are sitting all over the world and we are able to watch shows from any geography in any part, which was unimaginable like 15 years ago. So, so, so yeah, so I think cybersecurity will be, will be a backbone because so much information is being exchanged and, and privacy and, and, and data centricity um, will, will come in or, or identity theft. So that's that's something that will be a big, big, big problem. But seamlessness will be something that everyone's going to be looking for. Yes, I totally agree. It will be something defaultively that everyone would like to have. You won't buy yeah. a car that doesn't have it. And if it's okay, I'd like to move to our next question. How important uh, is the role of uh, AI, machine learning, data science, or VR or AR? Everyone is in his own perspective. Uh, could disrupt this this specific uh, space of the automotive? No. Okay. Okay. So, if you look at AI or ML, right? I mean, it's been around for a long time. Uh, linear programming has been around since 1945. Uh, stochastic deterministic modeling, data modeling, has been around for a very very long time. The only problem was the compute was very expensive. So if you wanted to run a neural network or a genetic algorithm uh, processing, it took very long time. You know, when I did this 20 years ago and I would run a CPLEX engine, uh, it would take three days for it to come back. Now it comes back in five minutes, right? Uh, so so computers becoming cheaper, whether it's edge computer, cloud compute. Uh, machine learning becomes interesting as 
it comes back to the same thing. Why do you do machine learning and why do you do artificial intelligence or, or neural networks? Is basically you're trying to find a hyper personalized space. Uh, so you're trying to answer a question which is specific to me, right? So when I say, you know, uh, what is the scene of an oranges? Is oranges a place in the US or oranges a place in Europe or oranges is a fruit that you eat, right? And that's that's what is coming in. So as all these vehicles generate a lot of data, as Dr. Ramya said, um, that data has to be made some sense. A lot of the data is just repetitive and junk. Most of it, actually. It's just the same data coming back again and again and again, and it has no meaning. But to find inference in that information, to say, hey, there is a voltage spike which is happening every seven days, and it's happening every X microsecond, and potentially that causes a, a, a fire in your, in your battery system. Someone has to be able to catch that. And, and that's where a, a sophisticated machine learning algorithm can have learned it. And then it can look at, it can pass through the data of, you know, a half a million vehicle fleet and say, hey, there are another 36 vehicles which can potentially catch fire. Uh, that's kind of where I see um, uh, that, that space going to. And um, artificial intelligence is still a long way to go. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't think, you know, whether it was chat GPT or something, but it's still a trained model. You have to feed data to it to train it. And then how that's how it comes out. It's not random. And it takes, it's very expensive. It costs billions of dollars per week to run that kind of a system. So I think that's still far away. But as these uh, IoT devices, uh, the car is a new IoT device, as it makes more and more data, we should be able to get more and more inference uh, coming out of it. And again, the inference is only for one thing, you know, to hyper-personalize. It has no other purpose, basically, to give it for that particular person and, and, and make it better. That's where I see it going. And whether it's on the edge or it's in the cloud, uh, that depends. Because the cloud and the edge will fuse. Uh, it's all it's all one pipe with 5G or even 6G. 6G trials are going on right now in, in South Korea as we speak. So. David? David? Yeah, yeah I, I not have a lot of uh, to really only that uh, really the all the AI, also for the software company, it's a lot of money that we need to put on annotation, PC, uh, platforms. Uh, but I like, uh, if I looking uh, five years ago, uh, AI doesn't know to detect a uh, object that's not classified. But today you have solution that you can detect also a object that's not classified on the your algorithm. You have still problems of uh, regulation of uh, of ISO and except how you can really re reliable for this model. But uh, it's something that will be solved. From the VR, I believe that uh, we will see some passenger cars that we have, like a, a hologram. When you left today, we have like for our car a speedometer that running with the the speed of the car. But today, I'm working with some companies in Japan that you seeing like a hologram that uh, coming before front of you. And you can see the view where you need to take turn left or something like that. And there also in the VR, you have a lot of uh, issues of uh, cyber that uh, some of the companies are afraid that you're telling that you need to turn left, but it's not you. Something that want to attack the car that you drive on that. And that's what I have to add from a Zvilik point. Nice, nice. Yeah, so for me, actually, uh, I mean, Shivalik was mentioning about the uh, uh, the predictive uh, maintenance or or even the diagnosis which can be done before so it will fail something. That's one aspect. The second, uh, the, there are also other aspects which I see. One is, uh, I think BMW has already introduced this heads-up display in their cars, right? You have those kilometers running, you have it on your windscreen. So you always have it there. Some type of an augmented reality where you have, okay, we use now some of the sophisticated navigation devices have augmented reality to give you better, uh, better navigation guidance, parking spot assistance. And main thing is we are going for the autonomous driving. And definitely, I think here, uh, AI will be much useful. Of course, I'm... Personal, this is only my personal opinion. I mean, I think David was talking about uh, the level five automation. Uh, I'm I'm okay. I'm seeing that this is pers pursued very 
seriously by the companies. But this mainly relies on the AI models, which means basically because uh, the AI is uh, is able to train itself. So just like a, a, an experienced driver. So the AI gets the data of an experienced driver and it trains itself to be an experienced driver, to give, be an autom autonomous car. So this is one aspect where I see the uh, future evolving. So in artificial intelligence. And of course, augmented reality, I think we have already started using in many ways. But the virtual reality part, I'm not sure whether whether we have a um, we will have a virtual reality created, maybe some surround view or some we will consider our car as a, maybe a, a a home or something. But that ha then if that is the case, then we have to the car has to drive on its own, which means just be autonomous car and we sit back and relax and we basically take rest as we take rest in, at home. So uh, this is the kind of. Um, yeah, technology advances, which I'm looking at in terms of AI. Seems very futuristic, but yeah, in, in terms of safety also, but yeah. Yeah, I can, I can agree about the safety part. And I have one last question, if it's okay by you guys. What is the biggest challenge as you people see in order to adapt early solutions in the automotive industry? So, you know, we are a global company and, and what we are seeing exactly what David was saying, the world is becoming more localized and not globalized. So every country has their own regulations, right? And, you know, if you look at just, um, there's a cybersecurity regulation, the WP29, the RS 155, 156 that you're aware of. Now that's a European Union kind of driven solution. There is a Japanese flavor to it. There's a Chinese flavor to it. There's an Indian flavor to it. There's no American flavor to it, right? Because they didn't sign the agreement. There's no Canadian flavor to it. So, so depending on which part of the world you are in, uh, the regulations will be very different, but you're, most of the OEMs want to sell globally. So if you look at the automobile industry, one of the reasons, let's say a Chinese OEM could not sell in Europe was because it was too hard for them to, you know, to standardize their engine and the emission standards. The cost was too high, so they would never bother. Now with uh, electric vehicles coming in, it becomes much cheaper. So you see a lot of OEMs going across the world trying to sell their vehicles because you don't have an engine, an IC engine. Now the flip side to that is as it becomes software defined, uh, the incumbent country is going to try and put some kind of regulation which will support their own internal uh, OEM, uh, which, is a, which is an incumbent. So if there's a new OEM trying to come in, it becomes harder for them. And, and so the regulations will become harder, very expensive. Um, and, and lots and lots of regulations, whether it's cloud regulations, data privacy regulations, cybersecurity regulations, uh, compute storage regulations. Um, and, and, and that's only going to get bigger and bigger. If you look at China, you know, they have updated the entire regulatory requirement, I think, last year or the year before. Everything got changed, right? And uh, so if you look at, let's say, Middle East, most of the countries don't even have a public cloud. And they don't allow, like Turkey, they don't allow you to take the data out of the country. So if you have to do anything and you have to do cloud, cloud compute, uh, you have to work in the data center. So which now means the entire technology stack has to kind of adapt to that ecosystem, which costs a lot of money and time. And then the smaller companies say, you know, I don't want to do it. It's, it's, it's not worth it. So so regulation is something uh, or, or localization is something that will be hard to deal with. Uh, companies and, and entities that can manage it um, can really blossom. The big giants anyway will try to but that's where I see a challenge uh, coming up. And, and that echoes what David also was saying uh, prior to me. Um, David? I, I, I maybe will uh, add a small point, really, the cost. Shvilek told that he global company. We are a small or medium company. I don't know. New Shvilek company, we are small. Uh, 70 employees here in uh, Israel, but the the cost when you need it's a major barrier and you know now all the ecosystem is not very investing in uh, companies it's a really barrier for us and for we adapt new technology that you can require and the second of all it's really the regulation because the you know the we talk about the AI or something like that uh, this run very fast but the regulation is not, and it's a little bit slow the company and catch us to run, run more fast. 
Um, and the third thing I think is the cyber security. And then more the cars come to be more uh, digital, uh, sensors. Uh, it's important concerns for any country, for any environment. Uh, like Shvilektor, we want to work with some countries like China. You can, you cannot take out the data that you record. You cannot to work in your network. It's also, uh, and if you work in China, we really cannot to go to Europe or something like that. Uh, we we have, uh, I believe that, that for all the, these three points that I put and Shvile put down some points, we you have a solution, but it's, it will take time. Dr. Anna, what, what are your thoughts? I think Shivalik and uh, David, they are uh, hard, uh, facing day, day, hard, hard realities day to day on the compliance and regulations aspect. I can agree with them. The One of the main things which I see, because I come from the connectivity, is the cyber security. I mean, it's very difficult to basically, for example, it's something like, uh, this is very abstract. How do I say my software is cyber secure? Can I say that it's 100% secure? I cannot say. At any point of time, I'm unable to say this. I'm confident to say this. I can say this functionality is working fine. Okay, breaking, yeah, yeah fine, it'll work. It will work 99.9% .9 or 100% test work. Otherwise, I cannot release it. But can I say like that for security? That's the biggest challenge. And with all these devices coming in, the different inflows of data which is coming in, it's very difficult for me to see where exactly the problem lies. Where is my system boundary? The system boundary, where, where is exactly, where do I get this? Where do I get, where, where are the points uh, where the data can get leaked? Or where can, where can there be security uh, vulnerabilities? And the second thing is, I have many chipsets also in my ECU because I have the Wi-Fi chipset, I have the Bluetooth chipset. I have the chipset for the, uh, I mean, the uh, wireless, I mean, the VTX communication. I have many chipsets on my car. So and with different vendors, with different suppliers. So it's it's just not, uh, it's a complex, the one ECU is a computer. So it's just like a person, it's so powerful as, or even more powerful than uh, our PC will be. So in that sense, we have lots of chipsets, lots of firmware embedded in it. Each and each firmware is from a different supplier. Uh, I mean, we have, uh, so this is also having, uh, so there are vulnerabilities which could be embedded in this firmware. Vulnerabilities could come from connectivity, vulnerabilities which, which could come in any way, which, which can be introduced in the software by, by the programmer. So there are different multiple opportunities for defects, which is very, very difficult to basically trace. So the system boundary is very fluid. That's exactly the challenge which I see, and which I see also for the cybersecurity space, where, uh, I mean, what type, what, what are the measures we have to take to say that we can be confident that we can release our ECU? So this is going to be a challenge. How do we convince our customers, okay, this is safe? So these are the things, uh, how do we then, if there is, a, if there is something going on in the field, then how do we analyze it? So we make it so cybersecure, uh, then is it possible to analyze some field effects? So all these are the questions which are coming up uh, and the regulations added up in addition. So in addition to the regulations, we also have the cybersecurity regulations coming in addition. All these are, I think, uh, challenges which we have to, uh, or the hurdles which we think, and, and the AI also, which I was talking about. AI models are uh, easily, I understood, can be easily stolen. So long, 10, 20 years back, I did a back propagation network to train Tamil characters. <laughs> At that point of time, the back propagation was a very, very basic model. So to train from, from uh, old Tamil scripts, uh, Tamil books. But now it has, we combine different models. We have more data. It's a juggernaut. So it's not so simple. Even with that model, I struggle to see even 40% accuracy. So that's how it is. So. Yeah, but if you if you look at the airline business or aeroplanes like Airbus, Boeing, you know Lockheed, etc., uh, they have a lot of data coming out. If you look at the amount of data one flight generates, let's say New York to London, 
it is a crazy amount of inf- data that they generate, you know, typically managed by the like Surgeon Electric, Honeywell, Siemens, you know, these kind of companies. So, and, and they have a protocol of how they do cybersecurity, right? When they uh, imagine hacking a plane, right? There's a very st- structured protocol. Uh, a lot of that is built in Israel right now, you know, where you guys are from. And uh, I think some of those good practices have to be adopted in the automobile industry. You know, what's what's working in that industry has to be brought over here. Same thing in the petroleum industry. If you look at the amount of data that the oil companies or the drilling companies generate, it is crazy. You know, almost 20 years ago, I worked with an oil company and they were they had their own, most of these oil companies have their own, uh, own private internet, right? They have their own hardwired uh, wires that go all across the rigs, et cetera, all over the world. So there are some good practices. It's just that it's not coming to the consumer space. Um, how much it costs, I don't know. But but some of those things will 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 come in and, and hardening will happen. So it will not be the Wild West as it is today. You know, systems will come into place. So All right. But there is one difference between the automotive industry. Maybe the flight, it is like, I'm not sure what, what else it talks with, what, el- what other devices it talks with. But the landscape of automotive is even more extended in that sense, right, Shivalik? So in that sense, because it's all... Number of- if you look at the number of suppliers in an airplane, it is crazy, right? And if you look at the number of devices that you bring in, you know, so many, so many people in a plane all charging their phones, iPads, laptops, all kinds of things. Um, and it is connecting to satellites, it's connecting to multiple satellites, it has multiple frequencies at which it's talking at. So it already has all these things. It just has a very good defined process. You have not heard of a software crash in an airplane. It does not happen. Right? But laptops and phones and all do crash. So so that that logic or that process or that methodology has to come to some of these industries and i think in the next few years that will happen as autonomous vehicle come as what david was talking about some of these will flow through it has to otherwise how how can you run a, a level 5 autonomous vehicle with no cyber security or you don't have you know guaranteed uh, you know safety so i mean that's who takes a life it's, it's more a liability question and a, and a lawsuit question than a safety question so so those things will kind of come in I totally agree. And what was funny around this uh, topic that in the automotive industry, this new regulation speaks about that each component that leaves your factory has to be secured in a certain uh, measure. And in the aviation industry, they don't have that regulation. Like potentially you can build up your own company that will integrate something into a car, into the plane, but there's no true standard except the company standards that you need to meet. So cars eventually, on based on today's regulation, will be more secure than planes, if you're looking down the line. And yeah, but there just, are not too many plane companies, right? There are very few plane companies. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, okay. Sorry. Fantastic. So I think that is uh, that is really insightful uh, coming out of uh, coming all these insights from our panelists. Now it is time to turn the tables, and in this particular section of the event. Uh, we request founders to uh, present the solution, talk about the competitive landscape, about the about the technology, and then we request panelists to brutally, brutally roast founders. And, and, and that's a, that's a, that's that's the section that I really love because I, I, I like founders getting all sweaty and and, and, and nervous, right? <laughs> so so uh, Alan, why don't we do this? Please get into the uh, into the looks pitch. Do a quick five minutes presentation, and then let uh, Dr. Ramya, uh, David, and Shivalik ask you some really interesting questions. All right, thank you very much. Please be gentle. Here in Israel, it's very hot, but in Germany, for Tom, it's a very nice weather at the moment. Yeah. So, okay, go ahead. Uh, we're Look Security. We're building an automotive security test and suit uh, for the automotive industry, but not only. Our solution basically covers all the activities that are required in the WP29 of the R15555 that basically is a major headache for most companies, not just in the automotive industry, but also in the automotive industry, especially when the regulation came in place. The challenges that our solution is coming to solve very quickly is first of all, the lack of qualified manpower. As you mentioned, the procedure itself is very hard to build software teams. And additional to that, the 
a penetration testing or security testing engine is going, um, it's a manual procedure. It means it cannot be scaled on every security vulnerability that the security researcher finds. It costs a lot of money to fix it because that same security researcher receives a release candidate of the device. Uh, put on top of all those, the tier one uh, companies, that just as Dr. Remia said, that they have a big headache of supply chain, all the unknown vulnerabilities that a third party company brings in when they bring in a modem or other types of binaries. And additional to all that, once the regulation came in place, it became a nightmare to all the players in the automotive industries from OEMs, tier ones, tier twos. Our solution is very simple in our point of view. Very important to mention our solution, we built it a lot before the regulation and just the regulation came in place exactly for our needs. So we build it a uh, automated fuzz test uh, fuzz engine in order to test all the different interfaces that these different ECUs speak with. We created a vulnerability scanner that basically extracts the vulnerabilities in the development uh, develop, uh, pipeline cycle. And in addition to that, we build a security test engine to come off a virtual finger and to touch different areas of the same component and to try to do malicious stuff, to try and play around fully automated. Our solution itself, it's a SaaS platform or a containerized platform. And the people that will be running our solution are the end users, do not need to understand anything in security, do not need to know anything in security. They can be a regular developer or a regular QA that just installs our agents on this computer. And while he does his functionality testing, he can perform security testing just in two clicks without really understanding anything in security. In high level, this is our solution and we'll be happy to be roasted. But gently. I have a question. You're telling that if we're putting it in our embedded system, one of our developers of QA, they will turn on your system and then we will see which uh, cyber issues we have or what? what, uh, what? So our system are, are not installed under on any ECU. Our system will be in a container or in a SaaS platform, depends on your company's regulation. And eventually, while he does his um, functionality testing from his computer on the specific embedded device that you develop in your company, he will run uh, the agent and the agent will run all the security testing. If it's fuzzin, penetration testing, the vulnerability scan itself will be part of the CI CD pipeline. It means that every commit that your developers will do, they'll get a list of security vulnerabilities. So this will be more for the tier one or this will be more for the OEM? So basically our solution is built for both the sides. Uh, in the end of the day, the OEMs uh, usually ask the tier ones to perform all the security testing. They usually add an extra bit of money in order to perform it. But the, because all the liability is on the OEM, they, if they would have had an automated tool, they would love to run it on at a, another test after that the tier ones have been sent to them. And we already have traction from specific OEMs that are already eager to use our system. I have a question. I mean, so the, basically it's not the testing, right? You are doing a vulnerability scanning, if I'm right, right? So, um, sorry. Uh, I don't know. So if I understood you right, maybe I understood you wrong also. I mean, for me, testing and the scanning are something different because for me, the scanning is, yeah, I get these scans. Um, and secondly, um, yeah, that scanning can be done remotely uh, using your uh, use, use your using your security testing suit. I mean, which you uh, which I install on my PC, um, and maybe I have the software bundle which I would flash on my target, and basically the same software bundle is analyzed by your app. This is what I think you will do if I'm right, or I'm. Maybe it's details of that. I don't know. But uh, the thing was, basically, you do the vulnerability scanning, right? But uh, it's not 
um, it's not the testing, correct? I mean, um, right? yeah, maybe I will take it along. Yeah, yeah, um, so it's uh, halfly correct because only one engine is doing this. Um, if you if you now compile an an image of your ECU and then you you want to do the vulnerability scanning, then it's only the part the one the, the second engine that Alon mentioned. Um, but we do have the security testing engine, which is something that. We have our own security testing. You can connect to an emulator uh, of your own uh, of the, the the ECU that you're working on um, through. If it's in, for example, if it's an IVI or over Android, so you can just connect to this uh, uh, to an ADB, and then we knows like our solution knows how to connect to ADB, to serial, to SSH with the different emulators and everything, and then uh, perform or conduct. Um, many security tests that we know that are actually um, that that will let's say uh, no, I don't say malicious, but I won't say malicious. It's just basically checking the hardening of the device itself. So it is very security testing. Uh, if you go in into an emulator and check, uh, and you are already inside the, the ECU while you develop it, and you check uh, hardening, uh, um, like if there is any. Uh, weird file permissions, you know, on the device or stuff like that. That's what you want to check. So we have a list of our own tests, mm -hmm. of our own checklist, let's say. Um, yes. And also we uh, we allow the customer to write his own tests in order to perform or conduct his test on his uh, on his ECU or on his developed ECU. And this is the security testing. Um, mm -hmm. And then the first engine, which is the fuzz engine, um it's also not really finding directly vulnerability but it finds things like crashes or, or bugs that could lead into a security issue right so you first find uh, uh, you can find a bug or some kind of uh, i don't know for example fuzzing a kernel module that you write by yourself if you fuzz the kernel module itself then you can uh, basically have uh, um if you find or you can find the very interesting things like buffer overflows or use after free if you're familiar with those uh, I guess you are and then um and then you can from this one it's not yet exploitable but it's a vulnerability that uh, found by fuzzing only the kernel module that you write the driver um or you fuzz the uh, this one i'm talking about the this, uh, let's say the software uh, level or you fuzz directly the the connection the interface you connect to a you connect to the UDS directly. You connect Canvas and then you speak UDS. And then we know we have a fuzzer, a specific fuzzer that know how to fuzz a UDS interface or know how to fuzz DOIP um, or some IP and very interesting, uh, very interesting interesting things in in order for at the end to have a, a good understanding of the security um issues that you have inside the system. And of course, you do it while you develop the whole ECU. Right, because if you develop the OLC, you want to know those security issues as soon as possible and then mitigate them, fix them, and then continue and do another round or another release. And that's basically uh, so it's not only vulnerability scanning, but it's part of it. Okay, so but uh, but then uh, but the but your first testing should know at least because I think your engine has testing engine should mm. be able to give some simulate some inputs so for that it should know of definitely course. some functionality of the ECU right otherwise uh, how does it do a first test yes you are absolutely right so we have a, a type of data sets um, for each fuzzer we have mm -hmm. different data sets that we um, um, that's basically out of the box data set that we provide um, and we also take under consideration things like uh, like information on the ECU itself. So when you onboard on our platform, when you onboard a new ECU in order to do any security test on it, any using any of these engines, um, one of the things that you can uh, do in the onboarding is, for example, if you want to do a UDS fuzzing, um, you will um, load a DBC file, and then with this within this uh, with this DBC file together with our data set. You can create a very good uh, um, coverage of a fuzzer, you know. Right. So, right. or for or if we speak about kernel modules, then uh, if you give us the all the syscalls of the module itself, then we know exactly how to um, change those syscalls and make sure that we are fuzzing the the right syscalls from your module and not only the and not just you know set of data that or set of calls that are not even relevant to your driver that we are now fuzzing. 
So mm -hmm. this is what we, this is how we do the fuzz. Yeah. Okay. I think then I think we should know because I mean it depends on the on the issue also. It I think because I think um, yeah I understood that it is it is a uh, it is a cloud based. But I think that uh, this should be this first testing should be adapted uh, for the different ECUs because I mean mm -hmm. we have different ECUs. Not all work with uh, DPCs. Of course. So yeah. So basically, there are different communication methods for the ECU. So yeah. um, so maybe some of the uh, microcontrollers work with the DBC because they use the CAN. Fine. Yeah. Uh, so so we have different communication mechanisms also inside the automotive ECU. So I think uh, this first testing uh, inputs. Uh, basically, I think you may have to know what. Uh, the communication method and and of also course, yeah. basically uh, I I think uh, the configuration that we use for communication I mean uh, so of I course think, absolutely that's yeah. exactly what you do while you do the onboarding of the ECU you basically you open a new ECU in our solution you open a new ECU and then you start configure it to the system so the system will know how to communicate what type of interfaces you have. You have a CAN bus connection, you have Bluetooth on it, you have vehicle, you have V2X, you know, vehicle to vehicle or V2V, you have a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or USB connection, if you speak about complex or infotainment system. So th those are the things that you give to the, that when you onboard the ECU to our system, you um, you can you can give this information to the to the while during the onboarding, and that's how we know what exactly we can do within this ECU. That basically give us the scope, the boundaries of this ECU, and then we know what to attack or how to attack. No, we know what to attack and how to attack together. So, okay. Basically, basically we need to give you the inputs so so that then, course, then the yeah. buzzer, the, the, we then the buzzer will manipulate those inputs. Exactly. We want to pinpoint the problem. We don't want to um the best, let's say the um we, we are not coming and say uh, let's uh, let's stop penetration testing. If you use our solution, you don't need to do penetration testing. This one we will not say. What we are saying is that with our solution, it's more of a, it's not a black box penetration testing. It's a gray box penetration testing. You know, because we are we we do it together with the development team, and we give the mitigation and all the remediation thing and how to do it. And this is during the whole development life cycle. At the end, when um, I would never tell any any uh, supplier or OEM, don't do penetration testing to your ECU. I will never do. I will never tell it because I do believe that penetration testing at the end there is some brain there behind, uh, mm -hmm. kind of a brainiac guy that knows exactly how to find things very interesting. But you don't want to have in the in this report from the from the brainiac guy from the penetration tester. You don't want to have a report that is just having very lousy things that he found. You want to you want him to find the big the heavy guns, um, and we are we are just helping you to find the low hanging fruits during the development uh, life cycle. And then when you send it to a penetration tester, he will probably find the the heavy stuff. And this is exactly the the idea. It reduces cost, reduces remediation things in order to find. Um, security issues already during development side. So let me, so Tom, let me understand this. Let me understand this correctly, right? So, so you go to an OEM, or you go to a. Typically, the OEM will define the security standards of their suppliers, mm -hmm. and then the OEM says, "Okay, these are my eleven. I have fifteen ECUs, and each ECU has two suppliers, so thirty suppliers, and they will connect you to them. Yes. Now, with each of these suppliers, you will essentially say, "Okay, give me." Uh, are you using an NXP chip or a Qualcomm chip? Is it a bare metal? Is it a POSIX? Is it an RTOS? Depending on the kind of ECU it is or the operating system, it has a file system. And then you'll get those details and say, okay, these are the system function calls or you know, these are how you access. This is a seed and key. So you'll mm -hmm. get a series of 15, 20 inputs for that particular ECU. Mm -hmm. And then uh, depending on what kind of CAN messages are going into it, you will, you will take the DBC file or the signals of that particular ECU. You will simulate a CAN can flow basically, uh, or a sill setup. And then you will start looking for conditions that, hey, does it do this? Does it do this? Does it do this, right? And and then you will give a report and say, okay, fine. Uh, this issue has, you know, blah, 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 things, but these seven things have a problem. 
and 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 there can be a buffer overflow or whatever it is, and and that can cause problem, right? Yeah. Now you will do this in all the thirty ECUs that this particular OEM has. Mm -hmm. Now, once you have done this for that particular vehicle platform, you pretty much have tested everything that you think is required to be tested. Mm -hmm. Now, my question to you is: once this, these ECUs are supplied from the from the tier one to the OEM, and the OEM makes a car, can you run the same test all over again at the end yeah, of life? While the car is built, you mean with after, multiple after the car is built? After, Sorry, after the car is built. After the car is built, so like end of line or in the parking lot. Um, yes and no, because um, what you said is a big is a bit of a mix of uh, things that we do. Because you went from uh, you know from a low level uh, syscalls and kernel modules to CAN messages and stuff like that. So it's it's somehow we do all of them together. But if you look at it on a on a let's say let's separate them together. Let's put every every category in its thing. Um, there are things that you, as I said before, you have a black box penetration testing and you have white box penetration testing and you have somewhere in the middle. And what's the difference? The difference is simple. Black box penetration testing is you get an, you get just an ECU like my phone, you know, this is basically as it is. I just bought it. I can buy it also in eBay, probably the ECU. And then I am, I start to uh, find problems to it. And this is the same. And this is, for example, something that will work on the category of uh, interfaces like Bluetooth, like USB, like CAN interfaces, like automotive Ethernet. And this is exactly uh, to answer your question is exactly the um, if if it's in um, if the car is already on the road, I can also test these devices, basically. Um, the problem is that it will take me much longer because if because I don't have a lot of information on the on the ECU itself or on the platform, on the entire car. Um, and the second is um, probably I will find less things than I will find if I have uh, if I'm in the in the middle zone, you know, in the gray box area. Um, and this is um, and it's possible, but of course, um, and and of course, if we speak about the category of the kernel module and everything, there it's a whole different level. There we can, yeah, this one is very hard to find, but we can find the vulnerabilities. How? If I just go to, if now I just go to Google and I find, uh, I'm, I'm looking for Hyundai firmware to do, if I have a Hyundai and I want to download the, the firmware and update my car. I can go to the Hyundai website and download the firmware. You can do it. It's not a problem. And then that's what I will do. I can download the firmware. Every customer can download the firmware. And then I can just throw it into my, uh, into this vulnerability scanner, this vulnerability engine. And, and there I will definitely find very interesting stuff. So it's a mix of things. So we are trying to come more into the, the during the development life cycle of the NCU and less to the, when after SOP, after a start of production. Um, but our solution can work on both. And, but it depends where you attacking it from, it depends on the vector that you want to come. So basically, I'll tell you why, where I'm coming from. So typically, if you go to the chief technology officer or the engineering head of an OEM, and, and he will go and tell his team that, hey, can you tell me what is the probability my vehicle is going to get hacked? Mm. Right? That's something he has to represent to the board and to his CEO. And, and, and else, right? And that's, that's something that gets asked of him. Now, he's not going to go into every ECU. There may be 120 ECUs on a vehicle, right? And, you know, different calibrations for different markets and multiple suppliers. So if at the end of line or, you know, you run a scan and, and let's say you are the, the preferred cybersecurity company that is working with their suppliers, mm -hmm. then it becomes much easier for you because you already know most of the things, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, of course. Okay. Okay. That's all from my side, Pankaj. That wasn't brutal at all. That was, that was very uh, soft from your side. Uh, David, any questions from your side? For Alon and Tom? No, no. Um, I'm now reading the website more for collect questions and check how it can be. <laughs> yeah, no, so uh, uh, this, is, this is really uh, insightful and uh, not brutal uh, at all. But yeah, let's, let's uh, look into other opportunities of collaboration. I'm sure that once you receive more information from Alon and Tom on Look Security, you'll be able to understand what could be the uh, opportunities for collaboration. And again, really, really appreciate your time today. Dr. Ramya had to leave because she had uh, other appointment. 
But yeah, would love to reconnect in the future and see how we can work together and uh, essentially grow together. Again, really appreciate everybody's time today and we'll reconnect soon. Take Thank care, you. stay safe. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.